Thompson, be <clears throat> Thompson begins her article by laying out what she takes to be the standard pro-life argument. And she then proceeds to present her own views and her own arguments as criticisms of one of the steps in this pro-life argument. And so what we want to do before we jump into Thompson's own views and her own arguments is understand this kind of standard pro-life argument that she is uh, criticizing, that she's attacking, um, and that gives the kind of context for her own views. So she claims... Uh, as I'd mentioned in the previous video, one of the things that's unique about Thompson's argument is that she is going to grant that the fetus is a person. Remember, Thompson is arguing for something like a pro-choice conclusion. She is nonetheless going to grant the claim that the fetus is a person. She thinks that even if the fetus is a person with a right to life, even if that's true, nonetheless, abortion is morally permissible. Okay, so she's going to grant that the fetus is a person from the moment of conception. Well, how is the pro-life argument supposed to go from here? <clears throat> Something like this. Every person has a right to life, and Thompson would agree. So the fetus has a right to life, right? If the fetus is a person, we're granting that for the sake of argument, well, then the fetus is going to have a right to life. Now, the mother of the fetus uh, has the right to decide what shall happen in and to her body. That's fair enough. But surely the pro-life argument would go, right? This is what she's recapitulating here. Surely the pro-life person would say, a person's right to life is stronger and more stringent than the mother's right to decide what happens in and to her body. And so the, uh, the fetus's right to life outweighs the mother's right to decide what happens in and to her body. This is how this pro-life argument would go. And so the pro-life thinker would conclude the fetus may not be killed and abortion may not be performed. That is to say, abortion is morally impermissible. So let's um, try analyzing this in premise and conclusion form. Let's try to break it down into each of the kind of constituent steps. So the very first thing, the fetus is a person. Now, <clears throat> that's the very first premise of this pro-life argument. Most arguments about abortion focus on that. That's not what Thompson's going to focus on. Okay, but uh, how is the argument supposed to go from here? Well, look, every person has a right to life. There's a second premise. From those first two claims, we can then conclude logically that the fetus has a right to life. Because look, the fetus is a person. Thompson granted that for the sake of argument. Every person has a right to life fetus has a right to life. Thompson goes on in recapitulating this pro-life argument. The right to life is going to outweigh the right to decide what happens in and to one's body, right? The right to life is kind of foundational. It's the most important right. It's the strongest right, the most stringent right, something like that. If there's ever a conflict between the right to life and basically any other right, the right to life is going to win because how could anything be more important or demanding than that, right? <clears throat> Something like that is the idea. That's the fourth step from which the pro-life thinker would conclude that the fetus may not be killed, that abortion is morally impermissible. Something like that is the standard pro-life argument, <clears throat> at least in Thompson's telling. And what she is well aware of is that most pro-choice thinkers would attack premise one. <clears throat> most arguments about abortion are concerned with that first premise. And so you find pro-life thinkers arguing for it. Right? That's what most pro-life arguments look like. And you find pro-choice thinkers arguing against it. That's what most pro-choice arguments look like. Thompson, as I've already said, is not going to do that. 
She's going to, even though she's pro-choice, even though she's going to argue for something like the pro-choice conclusion, she is going to leave that premise alone. She's going to grant it to the pro-life side of the argument. She's going to say, fine, you can have that. I'll, for the sake of argument, let's assume that's true. So this is uh, the kind of the, one of the most radical steps of this argument. Roe versus Wade doesn't do this, right? Roe versus Wade... In Roe versus Wade, Justice Blackman thinks it's very important to show that the fetus is not a person. And he gives these argument, uh, this argument derived from the way person is used in the Constitution and from uh, the history of abortion restrictions during the 19th century or whatever. Uh, not particularly compelling arguments, as uh, I indicated uh, when we were going over Roe versus Wade. But that would be an example. Right There's something like a pro-choice argument that's focusing on whether or not the fetus is a person. And Justice Blackman did that, you recall, because Texas had focused on the personhood of the fetus. Texas had argued that the person was a fetus. So look, both pro-life and pro-choice um, uh, advocates really focus on this first claim. Thompson isn't going to. Well, then how is she going to resist that conclusion? Number five there, that the fetus may not be killed, that abortion is morally impermissible because she does want to resist it. She thinks that conclusion is false. If you grant that the fetus is person, how can you possibly do that? Well, you'd have to look at one of the other claims. Every person has a right to life. She's not going to dispute that. She thinks that that's true. Uh, the fetus has a right to life. Well, that just follows logically from one and two. If you accept one and two, you have to accept three. And so Thompson because she thinks two is true, and because she's willing to grant one, even though she doesn't think it's true, she's willing to say, fine, we'll treat it as true for the sake of the argument, right? So she's willing to grant one. She's not going to dispute that. She's going to have to go along with three then. She can't find a problem with three, right? That's not where she's going to uh, focus her attention. And so that leaves one remaining possibility, number four. And that's precisely what Thompson's article, what her arguments attack. Thompson thinks that premise four is false and that this is uh, crucial for thinking through the ethics of abortion. And it's because four is false. That's why um, even if the fetus is a person, even if the embryo is granted to be a person with a full-fledged right to life, Nonetheless, abortion is morally permissible because four is false, because the right to life does not always outweigh the right to decide what happens in into one's body. But you might think, I don't know, that seemed really plausible. I mean, how the right to life, isn't that the most basic right? Isn't that the most stringent right, as it's put up in, uh, as Thompson puts it? How could the right to decide what happens in into your body or into uh, one's body, how could that possibly outweigh someone's right to life? That's what Thompson's arguments are going to uh, try to show. They're going to try to show how the right to life does not always outweigh the right to decide what happens in into one's body.